Hans Moser played an important role in the Canadian mountain community for over 50 years. He pioneered rock climbing and ski touring. He was a founding member of the Association of Canadian Mountain Guides. He created 10 feature length films about mountaineering, which he showed all across North America. And he created Canadian Mountain Holidays, the, the Heli Ski Company. It was a great shock to all of us uh, in 2006 when Hans Moser died in a cycling accident at the age of 73. I filmed this interview with Hans um, November 9th, 1996 in his home in Harvey Heights, not far from Canmore. Well, as far back as I can remember, I've always been somehow fascinated with the mountains. And my early experience, uh, I was either four or five years old. Uh, my mother took me on a train uh, to Graz. And before we got on the train at our station in Traun, uh, there were two young fellows that my mother seemed to know, and uh, they were going climbing. And the memory I still have today is uh, you know, these guys had their packs on and had their ropes. And at one point, uh, just as we got into the mountains, they got off the train to go climbing. and. Uh, to me, it looked like I just got off the train and went straight up the mountain somewhere. And that was really my first uh, uh, memory. Um, when I was 10, I was sent uh, four weeks uh, during the school year uh, to Bad Reichenhall. Uh, at that time, Austria was part of Germany. Reichenhall is still in the southeastern part of Bavaria, uh, very close to Salzburg. Uh, so I was sent there for four weeks to uh, well, get some fresh air and get some better food. I was a pretty scrawny little kid, undernourished and pale and gangly. And that was right in the mountains and this was just the most glorious time for me. We didn't do any real climbing in the sense, but we were on, went on quite a number of hikes up on some of the easier peaks and we were every day out in the woods uh, playing and uh, I, I could have stayed there forever, at least that's the way I felt at the time. And then finally, when I was 13 or 14 years old, a friend of mine and I uh, made uh, bushes out of pussy willows in the spring, and, and we made a whole bunch of these and sold them in front of the church, and that gave us enough money to again take the train, and we went up to a hut, this was in probably late April. Uh, there was still lots of snow up there, and uh, the hut was just jammed. I mean, all, all we could manage is to sleep under a bench, and uh, no blanket, no mattress, nothing. But during the night, I managed to pull a blanket off the person who was sleeping on top of the bench <laughs> until this guy woke up and started looking for his blanket. And then next day, uh, my friend wasn't too keen to go high up in the mountain, but I uh, you know, went up, just followed everybody, went up this big snow slope in sort of a uh, type Kulua and uh, got up on a ridge and then actually slid down on my ass and tore the butt out of my pants. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, you know, then I, 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 I was just anxious to to do it again and, and go again. Also in, uh, this was shortly after the war in 46, 47, um, we had a priest in our town who literally picked kids like me off the street and uh, I often think if this guy hadn't come along maybe I, I would have become a black marketeer and a gangster because you know, at that point in life anything is open. But this guy uh, literally picked uh, myself and, and other kids like myself off the street and took us skiing and this was my first time skiing in the mountains. I mean I couldn't ski worth beans you know, except to go straight down a hill and sometimes stop standing up and sometimes stop crashing. Uh, it, it, it was one of the greatest times, greatest experiences I had to that point. We spent the whole week in this little hut. He had organized food from his relatives who were all farmers because food was almost impossible to come by. So we ate relatively well. He would read mass to us every morning. <coughs> and 
at that stage we were receptive to anything and, and then we, we would ski uh, but it was uh, strictly touring you'd climb up somewhere or we tour to another hut and come back again and then the following summer he took us climbing near there on, on the Dachstein which uh, had some small glaciers on it it was my first time on a glacier first time roped up going across the glacier and then climbing up to this peak which was very hard but I even then I felt very comfortable and actually probably more confident than I should have. And then we joined the Alpine Club um, and one reason for joining the Alpine Club is A, to get a cheaper fee in the hut and you could borrow equipment there, you could borrow ropes, you could borrow a, a climbing uh, sneakers uh, like the Kletterbatschen and that's when I started climbing with the Franz Stop. I think we we did our what we could call first uh, real rock climbing, where we actually left our big boots at the bottom of the cliff and put on the clad the shoe and tied in the rope, <laughs> sort of you know, doing things that we watched other people do and uh, uh, climbed up this uh, a small subsidiary peak of the Dachstein. Then in the summer of '49, uh, France and I went. Uh, two weeks on our bicycles uh, from our home into the mountains and one of the highlights of the trip was that we climbed the Grossglockner and uh, that was again sort of a new experience uh, was certainly the highest mountain <laughs> that we had ever seen and, and climbed uh, the hut we stayed in was already well over 3,000 meters and uh, we didn't have any equipment we just walked up the glacier to this hut uh, without a rope or anything, mm -hmm. but then in the hut uh, we, we realized we better get some equipment so we, we you could rent an ice axe and crampons, so we put on crampons again for the first time, you <laughs> get an ice axe and then went to the top of the of the Grossglockner and uh, that then got us interested in more and more and more difficult climbing. We got in then with a group of other fellows uh, sort of our age, maybe one or two years older, who had already done some rather difficult uh, climbs and in the evenings occasionally we would go to Linz along the Danube, there are some granite cliffs and uh, we would uh, practice with these people and actually the first time I used the carabiner I made uh, a real ass of myself because uh, Franz and I were climbing a, a route on, on a peak near our home called the Gros April and it had a south ridge on it and on this uh, peak there was on the, 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 there are several towers on this ridge and on the first uh, tower there was a little traverse and you know, just sort of a crack going across the slab and, and there were two pitons in there and we had all this uh, equipment now a few carabiners a, a few pitons, a hammer, a few slings and a rope so we came to this place and uh, at that point I thought well you just use a piton like a like a handhold so I put my finger through this piton and I sort of tried to swing out onto the slab and I didn't like that at all I backed off again and scratched my head and then I I clipped the carabiner in the piton and put my hand in the carabiner which was a little better but I still didn't really feel all that hot to me and uh, you know, looking over everything I had, I thought, God, if, if I actually clip this rope in that carabiner, you know, then it's going to go really slick. And, uh, and I did it and went across without any problem and I actually thought I'd made a, a real discovery. <laughs> and we finished the climb and when we got back to the hut, I couldn't wait to tell everybody what we had discovered today. Well, the guys just killed themselves. <laughs> <laughs> made a horrendous ass myself, <laughs> but <clears throat> then we, we were in with these people who uh, who had uh, done some of the most difficult routes in this area, and there were some uh, several grade six routes, uh, really good rock climbing. And from the hut where we all stayed, they had a big telescope. You could actually watch people on some of the routes. So right away, France would say, "Well, yeah, next week, and we do this climb, or we do that climb," and we sort of screwed up our courage to try our first uh, grade 6 climb and because the one weekend we watched three of our friends uh, 
climb this route. It's called the North uh, Buttress of the Schwitzmauer. Well, next weekend uh, we left the hut at four in the morning and walked up to the start of this climb. And I distinctly remember the closer we got, you know, the more and more scared I got. And then we got to this place, and it looks rather forbidding. You sort of see all those yellow underbellies of those overhangs. So we climbed up to where he put the rope on and we sat on this little ledge and Franz looked one way and I looked the other way. <laughs> we didn't say a word, I think, for an hour. We just sat there. And finally Franz said to me, well, if you want to get up there, you better get going. And I said to him, if we are still alive today, we'll never go climbing again. <laughs> so we roped up and uh, started climbing and actually you know, it went a lot easier than I had anticipated. Uh, uh, pitons were all in place. And uh, we actually got the first difficult section behind us reasonably good. And then in the middle section, there weren't too many pitons, but it's still very exposed. And of course, you know, that's where our experience was mostly lacking because the pitons give you a lot of confidence. Well, about at that point, uh, two fellows came up behind us and you know, they were talking and joking and laughing, and when they came up, they, they were roped up, and in no time, you know, they were ready to pass us. And uh, so the one guy said something about maybe that we should move over, and I, I was a little, uh, well, just mouthed off a little bit at him. I said, well, you know, go piss up the rope or something like that. <laughs> and, uh, and then he he was telling me you know, that uh, that I, I I was really making a mess of this climbing, <laughs> that I should do it a lot more elegant. So I said, well, what the hell do you know about climbing? <laughs> well, the next thing we knew, these guys just moved out to the side and just you know, just went past us, just like that. But later on, we found out uh, one was Erich Warschak and the other one was Leo Forstenlechner. And these guys made the fifth ascent of the Aga North Face the first time without a beatbox. <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> anyway, we you know, we got that one behind us. Uh, certainly started realizing that uh, we had limitations. All these in these years, I I worked in Austria, and it was in the post-war era. It was a pretty a pretty grim time in in many ways, and I don't say that because. I suffered. I mean, you you grow up in that kind of milieu, and you make the best of it. And actually, I, I have the greatest memory of, of you know, even of the post-war time, in spite of how grim everything was. But at the same time, uh, you know, myself as well as many of my friends, we all had this urge to go somewhere else, to go to America, to go to Australia. We were even talking to go, about going to Egypt, just to go somewhere, and. Um, you were always hoping that there might be uh, a job that you could go to in, in some foreign country. That was the big ambition. So one day I met my friend uh, Leo Grillmeyer in Linz on the main square, and he said he was going to Canada. I said, well, what do you have to do to go to Canada? Well, he said, you, you can go and sign up over there at the travel agency. So I said, I'm coming too, and we both went to the travel agency and signed up. and. The deal was that the Canadian government was looking for immigrants to uh, come to Canada from uh, Western and Central Europe, and they would loan you the money to come here. And that was really the only way we could afford at this time to make that kind of a journey. There was no way, no matter how hard you would, you could save that kind of money. So we thought, well, that's a great deal. They'll loan you the money, we'll go to Canada see a new country, spend a few years in Canada, and, and come back home again. Of course, once we got here, it was a one-way ticket, and uh, things were fairly tough here, too. And, you know, nobody was waiting for you here to, uh, to, to give you something. You had to make yourself useful. And that was actually another good lesson I had in my life. I was 19 years old. I realized you better look after yourself, and if you want people to help you, you better do something for them in return. Uh, <coughs> when we came to Banff, it was late in the evening. Uh, in Canberra, we could still see the mountains, but by the time we got to Banff, it was dark. 
And what I hope to <coughs> actually do in Banff is find a climbing store and go and, and talk to somebody about mountains. Well, uh, on, on Sunday we walked up and down every street, but there wasn't any stores. There wasn't even a ski shop there. But I had another very fortuitous meeting uh, because as we walked along one of the side streets, suddenly I saw two people out on, on a lawn and climbing skins hanging on the fence and uh, their ski boots uh, sitting on the lawn. So I immediately talked to them and it turned out to be Ken Jones and Lizzie Rumble. And they had just skied out from a cinema and so you know, we, I was really keen to talk to them. Of course, they were anxious to get their equipment dried out and everything, but they were certainly kind enough to tell me where they had come from, and, uh, and I didn't realize that uh, you know, Lizzie would later on play such an important part in my life. What was your reception like, sort of with the Alpine Club, and the, uh, you know, how did you find your way into the climbing milieu? Well, already in Edmonton we <coughs> met the uh, people in the Alpine Club, and uh, actually my first climbing trip was uh, to Jasper on Roche Miette and with the Edmonton section. And I met people like Joe Cato, and they were all very nice. Uh, and, and one weekend, I think it was in April of 52, we drove up, stayed at the Pocahontas hut, climbed Rosh Miet, which uh, really made me happy. But that was also, I think, the, the day that I really felt homesick for Austria. And I still remember it, it just, it came over me like a flood. I just laid down, buried my face in the grass. I was so unhappy. It, it uh, really depressed me. But then uh, when we came to Calgary, Leo and I then moved to Calgary in early May of uh, 52, and again met the uh, people in the Alpine Club. Uh, and, uh, and then suddenly we had an opportunity every weekend to go to the mountains. And yeah. that, uh, <clears throat> it was just wonderful. And met other climbers. I still remember we did a, a climb on Mount Verandre, and I was so impressed because we, we spent most of the day climbing up, and there were a few interesting rock sections, which uh, was my forte. But then we got to the top, it was late in the afternoon, and I thought, how the hell are we going to get off this peak? And Jim, well, first of all, <laughs> I was impressed. We, we were sitting up on this peak, and that was my first uh, glimpse of the bugaboos. And then Jim would say, well, oh, here's uh, Mount Suarez and Mount that and Mount this. And I looked around and said, yeah, how the hell does he know this? <laughs> is this? And in every place I looked, there were just peaks, peaks, peaks. <clears throat> but he did. The bugaboos uh, stood out uh, very yeah. uh, distinct. And uh, Jim said then, you know, that's the place where you need to go if you want to have some good rock climbing. Yeah. And of course, from Veranda, we had a terrific view of Mount Assiniboine. It's, it's almost, you could touch it. And so I was impressed with that. And then, you know, as I said, I was wondering how the hell are we going to get off this mountain before it gets dark. And Jim just took us down the west flank. There was still lots of snow. This was, I think, in end of May or early June. And you know, he just knew exactly what he was doing. And in no time flat, we went down the steep snow slopes. Uh, got down to the call and uh, down a little further where we had our camp. Uh, that summer of 52, uh, Leo still was uh, recuperating from his broken leg. Um, I went uh, to the Alpine Club summer camp at Assiniboine, but I, I couldn't afford to stay in camp, so I had a little lean-to just between the camp and uh, Liz's place. The one day when I was just sitting in front of my little lean-to, uh, Lizzie came by with uh, some of her friends, uh, Muriel Gratz and a few other ladies, and, uh, and we got talking, and then she remembered that we met uh, earlier in Banff, and she said, well, why don't you come over and you can stay in my teepee, you don't have to sleep under the trees here. So I you know, kindly took her invitation and uh, took her and her friends up on Sunburst Peak and to show my gratitude. Anyway, that was then the beginning of, of, of our uh, friendship. and. Uh, on Labor Day weekend, uh, Leo and I went both out to Assiniboine. Uh, we, we hiked right from Canberra all the way into Assiniboine. We actually had a funny experience. Uh, we took the bus from Calgary 
in the evening after work and just started walking up from Canberra, walking along Spray Lake. And it must have been about one o'clock at night. We were already at the upper end of the lake there. And uh, somebody was coming the other way. And your, your eyes adjust pretty well to the darkness after a while. And, and I didn't think anything about it because in Austria, where we grew up, uh, it doesn't matter where you walk or when you walk, uh, you're liable to meet somebody. And then I thought, now who the hell would be walking here at one o'clock in the morning? Suddenly we realized there was a bear coming our <laughs> way. <laughs> well, at that point, the bear had noticed us too, and of course it was immediately gone. And anyway, the next day, then we just slept in the bush for a few hours, got up in the morning and walked into a center point the next day and spent the weekend with uh, Lizzie. <coughs> and then Leo <coughs> gradually got to where he could um, hike and, and climb. So in uh, November of 52, we finally got around to trying to climb Yamnaska. And, uh, we knew uh, Isabel Spreet, one of the members of the Alpine Club, quite well, and so she came along. Leo didn't even have climbing shoes. He had a pair of uh, regular street shoes with a crepe sole. And so we hiked up, uh, took the most obvious line, uh, and roped up, and Leo wanted to start out, and well, no problem, and Isabel was in the middle. And then Leo just wanted to do this climb the worst way possible and that was fine with me. He did a great job, just led all the way up. I was a little bit worried because I, when we saw this final chimney on top, I said, God, if we can get out on top of this thing, it would be a you know, pitch climbing back down again. But he found a little hole at the end and uh, we got to the top. It was, it was not a particularly nice day, but uh, it was sort of gray. There was hardly any snow that fall. It was a very dry fall in early winter, so the rock was dry and we kept warm by climbing. The only thing is when we got to the top layer, had two big holes, one in each uh, of the sole of his uh, shoes that had completely worn through from the rock. So that was uh, our first uh, real sort of challenging rock climb since we'd come to Canada. and. Uh, I thought it was fitting to call it the Grill Maya Chimney, since yeah. Leo did all the leading. Yeah. Uh, well, then, uh, of course, France uh, came then in, in the winter of uh, 53, and, uh, and although I had absolutely no problem climbing with uh, Leo, uh, somehow when I, uh, when I got into the climbing milieu in Austria, uh, th there was something almost sacrosanct about your climbing partner, and you always climb with your partner, and, you know, and your youthful idealism, you feel you're tied together for life and death. And so when France was here, I was really happy, and I thought we just picked right up where we had left off a year and a half ago before in, in Austria. So one of the first things actually we did was to, to climb the Calgary route. We hitchhiked out one morning from Calgary, made the climb, came back down and hitchhiked back again. Well, then I started meeting people like Heinz Karl. Plus, I, I had, uh, by then, opportunity to work uh, with Lizzie at Assiniboine in the winter, and I went out again in the summer, not to work, but to spend some time out there. And in, in the winter of 54, uh, worked both for Lizzie and Erling at Assiniboine, and in the summer of 54, worked uh, for Erling uh, the whole summer. So. At that time, I, I didn't really want to go back to Calgary. I figured I'd take whatever job I could in the off-season in Banff and uh, try to establish myself as a guide, even though I didn't have any formal training as a guide. Um, well, then I, Heinz Karl came then, and uh, Heinz and I got along very well and had some good times and good climbs together. And of course, Philip de Lisselle, who didn't have much experience climbing, but was very keen, and was actually a good partner to, to have. Uh, uh, did quite a few climbs with him. The first time I went to Louis was with Philippe, and uh, we did a route on the east side of Edith. Uh, and then, uh, well, in 55, I broke my leg uh, skiing uh, in early May, so that put me out for the whole summer. But then by 56, I was actually able to organize uh, 
my first uh, ski uh, touring trips uh, up in Little Yoho and at Rogers Pass. And then in '56, uh, Walter Perrin uh, asked me to come and, and actually take a, a test with him to to be legitimate. So that was the only formal exam I had as a mountain guy, which by the way I took with Bruno Engler, we were the first two candidates. <laughs> well, we spent a day uh, out on, in the Sawback Range on what they call the Guides uh, Rock, and uh, well, we had to show the climbing and route finding, both going up and going down, spent the whole day up there. And uh, then we went, uh, hiked, uh, God, I don't know how far up the Cascade, onto the East uh, Barnet Glacier to do our uh, glacier uh, show uh, step cutting and uh, all that stuff. And then uh, we did a climb of Mount Victoria. And then we had a one day written and oral exam. What was the difference between the license you got in 1953 and the one in 56? Well, it, you know, in, in 53, as I said, all, all I had to do is go to the administration building and I think Herb Asher was the chief warden and he gave me this piece of paper and I, I was just standing at the counter and uh, answered those 20 questions and then I paid I forget, $2 and I got this little badge that said National Park Guide. And then when Walter became Alpine Specialist, he called me in and he said, uh, I know you've got this license, he said, but I think for your sake, uh, it would be much better if you come, I'm, I'm going to give you a four-day test and, and then you, you can legitimately say that you've actually passed the guy's exam. So, no problem. In fact, I, I was really glad because I, 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 I sort of felt that, well, you know, am I really a good guide? Am I doing things properly? Because uh, whatever I knew, I more or less either watched other people do or experimented myself or read in books. And, you know, he was a, a real Swiss guide. And uh, I remember before I met Walter, when he was still working for the CPI, I'd met uh, Eddie Patrick in 53 at Assiniboine. And I was, uh, I was so taken by, you know, he was the Swiss guide with the client, they took him on Mount Assiniboine. And to me, it was just like, you know, I, I was dreaming that's something I would like to do also. So anyway, I, I was very, I'm you know, very pleased that Walter uh, instituted this test and, mm -hmm. and that I was able to take it. And then I, I got my first job with the Alpine Club of Canada to guide at the summer camp at Rogers Pass and, you know, and I had spent 10 years doing that and I think that was actually the, the best experience I had in my whole career to go every summer into a mountain range or a mountain area where I had never been before you know, and, and have to literally find your way. I mean, sure there were people help, willing to help you, tell you need to go there, need to go there, there were maps. But I really enjoyed going into an area, you're looking at the map, figuring out where all the different peaks were, going up on the first peak, uh, you know, and then right away seeing, aha, this is the route here, that's where you can go down. And, and going also with large groups of people. I mean, the first time I did the Northwest Ridge on Sedano, there were, there were nine of us, three ropes of three, and and at the end, I had, you know, I had everybody tied together on one row, like all the rope leaders tied together, and then get them over the top and down the other side. So that, that was a good experience. Um, and I was very busy <coughs> that summer, right off the bat, I had lots to do. But I still had this urge to do some some difficult climbs, and uh, I knew Hans Calden, and, and we had made a few attempts then to go up on Tiratissima and had problem right on the second rope length. There was a, a section with a fairly wide crack and we couldn't free climb it. <coughs> Didn't have anything uh, that would fit in the crack. And So then I made some wooden wedges <coughs> and in 57 uh, we, we made a, one or two attempts in the, in, in the early part of the season and then I was uh, busy guiding. In 57 I actually consider one of my most successful years as a guide because uh, I made the, the first guided ascent on Robson in I don't know how many years. Uh, I mean, Robson hadn't been climbed for many years anyway. And then I think in the late 40s or early 50s, uh, 
some Americans climbed it again, and uh, and ours was the first guided party. And I had uh, Frank Stark came along, and guided the second rope, and that was a great trip. And I, I, I really felt this was a sort of a good good test of uh, what we could do as guides, because there was still a huge mushroom over the top. It was quite challenging to get over that. And then uh, after the climbing season, then Heinz and Leo and I. I uh, took another stab at uh, Diretissima and actually managed to go up without too much difficult using uh, wooden wedges on that one uh, section there. We were worried about uh, what was going to happen when we got to the big overhang. Uh, but actually, just before you get to it, there's a, a little bit of an overhang with a, sort of a slab on top. Uh, I think that was probably the technically most difficult thing. To, looking at the route the most worrisome was but when we got there we saw the way clear and then uh, Heinz uh, I, I had been leading up to the point and he was just chomping at the bit to do his part and, and actually the last two rope lengths uh, it turned out to be uh, pretty challenging too particularly the last one uh, so Heinz led that in a fine style we thought we might have to spend the night or retreat again, and, and once we saw a way clear to get out uh, under this uh, big roof there, well, we, we were down in good, in good time. Yeah. Anyway, we were very happy when we managed to do that. Yeah, it's a great classic now. Was it the next year you, you did the, uh, the third ascent of Mount Alberta? Yeah, that was in 58 then. That was again with Heinz Karl and Leo came and uh, two clients in a sense, uh, uh, Neil Brown and the shark of Spinkover. I wasn't pleased about our descent. Uh, that's one thing I, I hadn't uh, learned at that point yet. It's, it's better to make more shorter rappels than a few long ones. Uh, we had uh, two 40-meter uh, ropes along so uh, we just tried to make these 40 meter rappels, but uh, the terrain is, is fairly broken and uh, God, we got the rope hung up and just spent a lot of time. We just got down to the big uh, Taylor slope uh, below the main part of the mountain and then we spent the night there and climbed down the next morning. Uh, if, uh, if I had uh, been smarter and uh, just, we could have easily set up two rappels, have two rappels going at the same time. Uh, I think we would have made it down in one day. Anyway. Yeah, <laughs> it would be nice just to know a little bit about those early years, uh, your ski, skiing at Stanley Mitchell there. Well, I'd, I'd say next to Assiniboine, uh, you know, these were probably the, some of my nicest times in the mountains uh, because it, you know, again, there was sort of a a mysterious aura to you know, spend two days to go up in this uh, totally quiet, silent, forgotten valley and, and then get to this hut and see this hut with a huge pile of snow on the roof and the trees and, and then all these beautiful mountains around and the good skiing. I just loved it up there. And Leo and I worked uh, really hard to, to run our camps up there. We, I know the first year we'd spend uh, two weeks uh, packing all the food up there. We could only drive a little bit up the Yoho Road, uh, not even to the switchbacks, uh, just a little past the bungalow camp down there. So we spent uh, several days packing all the food to the ranger cabin at Takaka Falls, and we would make uh, three round trips a day. <laughs> so we're just going like hell, carrying the food there, and then once we had the food there, we'd uh, uh, pack up in the morning, uh, to the Mitchell hut, each a load, and then we'd spend the rest of the day shoveling snow, cutting firewood, and then next morning we'd ski down, carry up another load, and work up on top again and got the thing ready. And then when a guest came, uh, one of us would go down the field, pick up the guests, bring them to Takaka Falls. Everybody came by train, spent the night at Takaka Falls. Next morning, bring them up to the Mitchell hut, usually get there at two in the afternoon and then spend the whole week uh, touring with them. And you know, it, it was just such a wonderful uh, experience for everybody to, to be together in this hut, to 
it seemed like we were far, far away from everything. Uh, have these nice trips every day. You know, at the end of the week on Saturday morning, we'd ski out. We'd make it out in half a day, all the way to the train station. Say goodbye to the one group, pick up the next group. Uh, uh, no, those were just some wonderful years. Yeah, I I formed a, a company in uh, uh, I think '55. Actually, formed a company called Rocky Mountain Guides Limited, and then uh, actually later changed the name to Canadian Mountain Holidays. And Leo and Heinz Kahl and I were partners. And then when Heinz Kahl uh, died, uh, Frank Stark uh, became a partner in it. And late, later, um, um, Leo bought uh, Frank's uh, share out. Because Frank, too, then had an accident uh, where he lost his kneecap and for several years uh, didn't think he could ever ski or climb again, although later on he did. So that, you know, we, we were incorporated then. It, it really didn't mean a hell of a lot. We, we didn't make any money and, and couldn't even care because uh, we didn't owe anybody any money. Uh, we always had a place to sleep at night and we never went to bed hungry and essentially <laughs> the world looked fine to us. Yeah, yeah. Late 50s there you you started your uh, expedition career I guess with probably Mount Blackburn in 58. Yeah, that was the first time I went up to Alaska. I met uh, Adolf Bitterlich, who helped me on the ski tours up in Little Yoho and at Rogers Pass, and he uh, was going on this trip with uh, Leon Blumer and a couple American fellows, so he said uh, I should come along. It was a real eye-opener uh, to see the size of the country, the huge mountains, and at the same time it was a real confidence builder, you know, seeing that uh, uh, both Adolf and I could do really well up there. I had no problem with the altitude, with the technical difficulties. I hitchhiked up the highway and uh, going past uh, Kluani Lake and uh, looking back into its, uh, the, the Kaskawatch uh, Glacier, I was then already thinking, well, you know, that'd be a nice uh, objective to go and uh, climb Mount Logan. And on the way down, uh, Adolf and I had a lot of time because we hitchhiked together and we spent a lot of time sitting by the side of the road. I sort of began dreaming and in a sense planning to go on Mount Logan. So then as soon as I got home I actually uh, began uh, organizing a trip to Logan and uh, thought um, a neat way and also of course the cheapest way to do it is to simply walk in and walk out. and. Uh, planned on that basis uh, and asked uh, Philip de la Salle with, we were really good friends and I felt he had enough experience in that and then uh, really Pfister uh, was interested in coming, uh, Ron Smiley, uh, ski shop owner in Calgary and then uh, two young fellows, uh, Carl Rica and Don Lyon and I think uh, you know, we were a pretty strong team, uh, we, we didn't have should I say, a lot of experience in, in this type of uh, expeditioneering. The way in, I, I was uh, quite overwhelmed by the distance and by the vastness of the country and how physically hard it was. We, we carried big loads going in. We had one airdrop at the base of the mountain. And then uh, the climbing went fine uh, once I realized how fast we could move on the mountain, which is the went for it, maybe a little bit too fast because we didn't give ourselves too much chance to acclimatize, but uh, the only time we really suffered was uh, just the last day when we went to the East Peak. Um, some people more than others, but everybody made it to the top and uh, a little bit of after effect when we got down to the high camp, which was at about 16,600 feet. And then uh, next day we started right back down the ridge again. And again, I, you know, I realized we were moving fast. Uh, when we came to uh, Fortin 4, we just uh, stopped, rested for a few hours in the tents, uh, waited till it got a little cooler, and then we just pressed right on. Went all the way down, uh, 
and we're actually surprised that the steep slope that takes you from the Huppert Glacier up onto the East Ridge, when we went up, it was just a beautiful snow slope. When we came down, got it, you know, it had avalanche and runnels and ice, and but by that time it was one o'clock in the morning, we didn't really care, we just <laughs> sort of went for it, went down, and then uh, uh, rested a few days at the bottom of the climb, and then thought we would uh, you know, put everything in one of those makeshift toboggans, uh, the, one of those rescue toboggans, but we had so much junk and uh, the toboggan didn't work worth a damn. It would have been a much better if we had uh, one of those uh, pukas. Or Anyway, uh, after just a few kilometers, we stopped and started discarding everything we knew, uh, cut the food down to what we thought we absolutely needed to get back out to the highway, and, uh, well, and then we just hoofed it. One uh, big boo-boo I made, I, I was the one doing the air drop, and uh, after the air drop at the foot of the East Ridge, we had three rubber rafts, which uh, I had to drop uh, at the snout, uh, near the snout of the Downshire Glacier. And for, you know, I saw all these huge gravel beds, and I thought, well, when as it gets warmer and things start melting, this is just going to be one big wide river. So I dropped the rafts on, first of all, on the wrong side of the river, because I didn't really look that closely at the glacier, and didn't, I didn't even think how difficult it might be to get off the glacier, on which side we would get off and unfortunately dropped one of those rafts right into a bush and the thing was, was just like a sieve. So uh, and so we you know, we got off the glacier, came down to the snout of the glacier, had quite a job uh, crossing the river and retrieving the rafts and bringing them over to where we were. And then only having two of those little rafts and, and they weren't nearly as uh, tough as the kind of rafts that are being used today. Uh, and not having any idea about uh, a big river and how dangerous it can be and, and all the problems down below with uh, snags in the river. Well, we just tied everything together, the two rafts together, made a huge float out of our skis and air mattresses and uh, two people in each raft and all the gear on top of this big float and uh, Carl and Don were lying on their belly on top of the gear and <laughs> we started down this river. God. And I thought this was just great, no effort, just going down the river. And uh, and at one point we were going through this section where there were fairly big waves. And of course, going over those waves, you know, the, the the rafts in front would shoot up. And, and as they go down, they'll really propel the float in behind up. And, and then the float would just jam into the rafts. Uh, in the valley of the between the next two waves. Well, at one point, uh, some of the skis went right through the raft, and <laughs> the whole thing started to sink. So, and in the meantime, the skis had also worn uh, through some of the air mattresses. So we had to get off, and uh, fortunately, the river widened out again, and we could uh, rescue everything onto a gravel bar. But then we noticed that the water was rising very fast, so we got off this gravel bar and got onto the shore proper. But unfortunately, we hadn't learned our lesson yet. We still had uh, one raft, and we still had a few air mattresses and skis. So we tied uh, most of our gear onto this one flat, uh, onto this one uh, raft, uh, and decided that Willie and Ron Smiley would take the raft down the river, and the four of us would have to walk. So at one point, we, we had most everything on the raft, but then like I realized I didn't have anything to carry and I thought well I can carry a little bit so I opened the bag, my bag on the raft and the first thing that was there was, was a few plastic bags with all the film I had shot. So I took the film out of it. Uh, Philip de la Salle left all his pictures on it. Anyway, to make a long story short, after these guys left, uh, they got uh, tangled up with some major snags and just totally out of control. I mean, the snags would just take them wherever the river would take the snags, and you know, one time they'd be in front, one time they'd be behind, and almost made it down to the highway, about maybe one and a half kilometers above the Donchak River Bridge. 
they hit one of those uh, snags that sort of sticks up on the water against the current and this whole raft and everything just hit this thing and, and got jammed under and they they actually had to swim for it to get get to shore and, and everything we had was lost. Yeah, but a tragedy. Yeah, well, I mean, a tragedy, yes, uh, lucky you know, the, the, the two of them could have drowned in there, they could have been pinned there or something. That's right. But um, you know, it certainly taught me and I think all of us a lot of respect yeah. for these rivers. A few years later, maybe, well, of course, there was the, the ski trip in there, uh, the, the, the Great Divide Ski Traverse. That was the 1960 then, when we tried to do that trip. After Logan, uh, I felt you know, I had experience uh, traveling long distances in that kind of uh, terrain and, 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 and remoteness. Uh, and in the beginning, things went pretty well. And I had flown the route a couple of times with Jim Davis, and we put the food caches in. When we got up on the Lyle Ice Field, we got hit by a fairly good storm, and I couldn't find the food cache up there anymore. That uh, we found a cache with uh, some climbing material that I thought we might need going down the East Alexandra Glacier, but I couldn't find the food cache. It was totally snowed under. And then we had uh, a few harrowing experiences going down the East Alexandra Glacier. First an avalanche came down, which uh, was turned out mostly dust, but it, well, f f the first thing happened, I almost skied off the big ice fall uh, as you come down from the Lyle Peaks, uh, and I don't know what made me stop. Anyway, uh, <laughs> that would have ended the expedition with a bang. <laughs> So we got around that, then when we were down on the glacier, this avalanche came down, which shook everybody up, and not long after that, I fell into a crevasse. <laughs> but, you know, I, I mean, I've, I've always been fairly fatalistic about these things. I, I don't have nightmares about them, and I, if, if I'm not too badly hurt afterwards, I don't even shake. But I, I think some people uh, got pretty shook up about it. And when we got uh, down below, where we had to turn up the uh, up to it's the castle guard. Uh, uh, Neil Brown actually uh, wanted to leave, so we were down to five, and uh, pretty hungry, hoping uh, to, to find the food cache up on the Columbia Ice Field, which was also one of the first we'd put in. And then I I just chickened out we, because by the time we got uh, up near the castle guard meadows, we'd put in a long day. Uh, didn't have much to eat, and I figured if we spend another day tomorrow and not find the food cache, and then have a long day coming out, uh, might be uh, might be a little too tough for us. So we decided to come back out to the highway, reprovision, and then go up from the uh, <coughs> from the uh, uh, Saskatchewan Glacier side. Well, once we got down there, we the group was down to three, and. Uh, the whole, like the tents, it was a one big tent for six people. Nothing just made sense anymore, so we just threw in the towel at that point. A few years later, you were up on Mount McKinley, the climb you got the most note, noteworthy climb, you know, big new route on Mount McKinley. That trip uh, also was partially inspired by a series of photographs that Brad Washburn uh, had published in the American Alpine Journal, suggesting all kinds of different routes. and. I thought uh, I'd, I'd done a few trips and perhaps I had the experience to try one of these routes. And uh, since there had been very little activity on the north side, we chose to go for the north side. Now Washburn suggested two routes, one up the Jeffrey Spur route, which is really on the side of the Vicar uh, Ball, and one straight up the wall. And we went there and said to ourselves, well, we'll, we'll go to the base of the mountain and then we'll decide which route we'll tackle, see how it looks. Well, when we got there, after not that big a snowfall, like one and a half days, there was a huge avalanche which from our vantage point looked like it just swept the whole phase. So as far as I was concerned, that definitely ruled out going up the middle of the phase. So we chose the Jeffreys Borough, which is a much safer route, uh, not nearly as hard and as bold as going up the middle of the face. 
but even there, I, I was very gun shy of, of getting avalanched on, on that big flank. And after we were at about 14,000 feet where we had a camp, uh, when we got snow overnight again, I said to everybody, uh, we, we just better push up in one day and get off the face prop and, and get up to about 16,600 feet. And in retrospect, that was a mistake because it meant we went up again too fast. Uh, we left a lot of our supplies behind because we couldn't carry everything at once. And most of the trouble we had up on top, I think, were because of that decision. Because then from there, again, within two days, we will uh, see Hans Schwartz and I always were one day ahead of the group. So we, we would go ahead prepare the route, scout out a place, come back down, the next day all of us would go up. And um, and then the following day, while Hans went ahead, the others would go back down and bring the rest of the supplies. <coughs> so we were better, we, we were one day ahead of everybody in, in acclimatization. And, and that really started showing up when we went up to the big plateau below the North Peak. Uh, the first day, Hans and I went up and it took us six hours uh, just to do 1,500 feet. Well, the next day, we went up in an hour and a half, and the others took six hours. And then the following day, you know, we went uh, for the peak, and Hans and I well, didn't uh, struggle too hard, but everybody else just couldn't do it. And two of the fellows, uh, Tom Spencer and Hank Kaufman, they were too sick to get out of the tent even. So as a result, uh, uh, Dieter Raubach, uh, Pat Boswell, and Leo turned around, didn't go to the top, but Gunti Prince uh, uh, toughed it out and went to the top. And then when we came down, uh, we could see the two uh, fellows that were sick, uh, and they were, to, they were going downhill fast, and we had to get them off the mountain. So we next morning, uh, the weather was very bad. We tried to get off this plateau, and then we got to the edge of the plateau, and it was just a raging storm. So we uh, set up tents again and uh, hunkered down for the night, but in the worst possible place, up on the plateau, it was very noisy, but the snow got blown away, but on the, on the edge now, the, the snow started building up over the tents, and when we got up in the morning, the tent I was in, it was, it was just literally on top of our face, but we managed to get out, but the other tent it was just completely smothered under the snow. So we had to dig the guys out, and we were trying to dig the tents out, and then the weather looked like it was breaking a little bit. So immediately Hans Schwartz took off with uh, Tom Spencer to get him down, and a little while later I followed with Hank Kaufman. And the plan was the others would just uh, tear down the camp and then follow right after us. But I had just barely left, and, and the storm just started in full fury again. And uh, at one point, the uh, Hank just slipped. Uh, well, what I couldn't have him, have him go ahead of me because he, he he just was too lethargic, didn't know where to go. So I we had a fairly short rope, and I went ahead, and I just kept pulling him down. Well, at one point, I pulled him down. Uh, we were on a patch of ice. He sailed past me yanked me right off my feet, and he stopped in a little patch of snow, but I had so much momentum, I went right past on the ice, yanked him out of the snow, and for a while we just leapfrogged down, and I thought, we're never going to stop. Fortunately, then we both uh, stopped in the same drift of snow, got down to where we had a cache at 16,000 feet, and no Tom Spencer, no Hans Schwartz there. And this was a big rock, sort of a solitary rock, where we had left our skis and uh, some food and some gear. So I didn't know what to do, and uh, Tom was, uh, or rather Hank, was in pretty bad shape, so I just sort of piled him under the rock, let him lay down, and I was just sitting there scratching my head what to do, and all of a sudden Hans comes back. He says, well, he, he's just a little bit out on the flat there, and he dug a, a trench, and if we take all the skis over there, we can make a roof over it and uh, pile snow on top, and then we could put the two guys in there, get them out of the bed and the sleeping bags. 
So we moved everything over there, and after we had the two guys in there, then we dug uh, a bigger uh, snow cave for ourselves, big enough to get them, to bring them in. And once we were finished, we brought them in, started making soup and uh, get liquid and some food into them. And uh, after a while, they actually began to respond. But then we sat there that day, the next day, it just kept storming, no sign of the other guys. And we really uh, worried and then on the th on the what's on the third day then it started clearing and we looked up and uh, there were two of them coming down the ridge four of them no two four we were four two were coming down the ridge so what happened to the other two so when they came down it was uh, uh, Pat Boswell and uh, Gunti Prince and they said that Leo and Dieter were up in the snow cave and they couldn't move. That, uh, that Leo had gone blind and uh, all kinds of terrible things. So Hans Schwartz and I just packed up, went up again, and uh, Leo looked like an 80-year-old guy. He was just propped in the corner of the snow cave. Dieter didn't look quite that bad. <coughs> so I had some uh, drugs along. I, I gave him some benzodrine and some 292s and some tea, and uh, packed up their gear, and then uh, we just got them on their feet and, and brought them down to the camp. And actually just bringing them down to 1,500 feet, uh, they, they improved dramatically. So then we spent another night at that lower camp, and uh, we, we did have a radio contact because I was uh, rule you had to have a radio along and you had to check in with uh, some outfit in Anchorage. So we knew that another storm was coming. So I said, next morning we'll, we'll just get the hell out of here, no matter what. So next morning we packed up, uh, went down um, into the saddle between the North Peak and the South Peak, and then up to the West Ridge uh, on the South Peak. And uh, and then on the South Ridge, we actually ran into some tracks from, uh, and later on actually ran into a group from Seattle led by Dick McGowan. So with these people, we went down on the south side then to uh, 14,000 feet and set up camp there. And on the way down, we'd already ran into one food cache that these guys had left behind. So we gorged ourselves on that stuff there and then down below in camp, uh, we, we were barely set up in camp when uh, the plane came in, uh, it was Don Sheldon from Talkeetna, and he dropped a ton of food to them. And we found out then they didn't get their airdrop prior to the climb, which they had to abandon anyway, they didn't make it to the top. But you know, they got their airdrop now that they were on the way down, so they had all kinds of food and uh, gave us uh, anything we needed. And we had still quite an episode there because uh, they had one fellow with a badly frostbitten foot and uh, Don Sheldon was supposed to come in and pick him up. Um, and uh, when he came in the first time, when conditions were good, Dick McGowan said to me, he said, uh, look, it's, I think I better go out first because then I can push Sheldon from down below that he keeps coming back because sometimes he isn't that reliable. And you know, I didn't know... What, uh, you know, how reliable or unreliable Don Sheldon was. I knew, I knew he had a hell of a reputation as a pilot, and I thought, you know, McGowan knows the score here, so I said, no problem, you go. Well, uh, then the plane didn't come back for two days. You know, no word, nothing, and, and uh, you know, here we had these people left without their guide and everything. You know, I, I felt a little responsible, but... Uh, Anyway, to make a long story short here, uh, two days later, we, we diligently every day would pack this landing strip, and uh, one night, it was quite windy during the night, and in the morning we were still in our tents, we hadn't even dressed yet, I hear the plane, and I look out, and I see this plane coming in, uh, and I, I could see there was only one thing he could do where he was, and that was land, and, and the whole landing strip that we had packed the night before had all these big wind drifts on it and he just plowed in there and landed the plane 
Well, we quickly got dressed, and, and, and he wanted us to pack this thing down so he could take off, and which we did, but uh, it was way too soft. By the time he tried to take off, he was stuck. And uh, we ended up spending another two days with Don Sheldon and his plane being stuck. We first spent almost the whole day trying to get him down this glacier, always packing another landing strip, and by the, finally it was snowing really hard and we were really in the clouds. He thought if we skied ahead of him, he would taxi behind us till he got below the clouds and then take off. Well, finally we, we got stuck and then after two days when it cleared, we finally got him up one and uh, he took off. Uh, no, he, he still didn't take off with his kid. He kicked the kid out again with the frostbitten foot because he couldn't take off with him, took off by himself. It was only a few days later when he came in finally to pick him up. By that time, we'd skied down the Talkeetna Glacier to a little side glacier where we set up camp, and which was his usual landing place. And there we ran into some other people then, and uh, Ed Carter and a party who were coming in to climb uh, Mount Huntington. And uh, well, eventually we all got out. Yeah. After 1963, you began to do, devote more of your time and energy to guiding and CMH. Well, then, uh, yeah, I, I got busy and busy guiding. Uh, I was uh, traveling around showing my films and uh, well, then got into the helicopter skiing in 65 and that really sort of changed the whole complexity of everything I was doing. I, and especially when the helicopter skiing really took off and uh, we decided to build a lodge. In, in the early years of the lodge, I still tried to actually guide all summer, but uh, finally I had to realize to keep this business going and uh, I, I had, had to become a businessman. <laughs> Looking back now, I've, I've had a good, interesting life. I had my time in the mountains. I had my time as a businessman. So what, uh, what can I ask for? We didn't talk about the creation of the Guides Association at all, the, how that came about. Well, uh, what happened uh, then after uh, Bruno and I took this guide exam, well, then there were a number of other people who, who went and, and took the exam with... Uh, with Walter, and in most cases, Walter would ask them to get a letter of recommendation from me. And uh, pretty soon, uh, I, uh, you know, and he he would get this letter of recommendation and take them out on, on his prescribed test. But pretty soon, uh, he would actually, if they came with the letter of recommendation, he would just give them uh, the guide certificate. Uh, it was either too busy with other things, uh, and. Uh, that uh, actually didn't, I didn't think that was, was proper because uh, on the one hand, most of the people I knew, uh, most of them were friends of mine and I certainly had no problems recommending them, but I didn't think that they should be pronounced guides on the basis of my letter of recommendation. When I talked with Walter, he said, well, what you guys really should do is form an association and, and have your own guides training program. And that's what we did then. So in 63, we got everybody together who had then uh, a license from Walter Perrin and we formed the Guides Association. Where of us did you have your founding meeting? It was at Lac des Arc in Heinz Karl's cabin. Was it? Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah, it's a <coughs> fitting place for it. Yeah. How many of there was you in attendance? Well, let's see, there was uh, Peter Fuhrman, Heinz Karl, uh, Brian, uh, Dick Lofthouse, uh, really Pfister, well, yeah. Leo, of course, was there. Leo was there. And uh, so Peter Fuhrman became the president, and I uh, became the chairman of the Standards Committee. And because there was big discussion initially, uh, we, some of us thought, well, we should test ourselves, really start proper, but uh, in the end, uh, we said, okay, anybody who's had the thing from Walter would be a member, and uh, and then I set to work and, and actually wrote a two-week training program with a fairly elaborate uh, exam procedure at the end. And the idea was that uh, 
that we as the association, uh, Tax Canada, through Walter and the Alpine Club of Canada, each would uh, uh, be present at the exam. <coughs> and Brian ran the first course in um, 66, I believe. Or was it already? Six, maybe 64 even. With four people. And I thought you know, this was great because he was certainly uh, one of the most experienced people we had in the association. But um, I don't know what happened during the course. At the end of the course, uh, everybody, the, the four candidates, they seemed to be unhappy. Brian was unhappy, and he, he, he had nothing to give me as to whether they passed or not. Uh, and basically dumped these four people in my lap and left. And here were these four people. They wanted to know whether they passed or not. And I just uh, marched them all up to the administration building and pronounced that they had all passed. <laughs> they all got their license. <laughs> and then uh, it, you know, the, it, it seemed almost impossible to get people to want to take the course, although there were a lot of people who would want, it, want to be guides. So some of them, and I think Bob Gieber was actually one of the ringleaders there, they came to me and said, well, why, rather than having a two-week course, why don't you do the course over five or six weekends? two days at a time, and, and then four days at the end. So we ran uh, this course and, and had the proper exam at the end. Uh, yeah. Then we, we ran a few more courses based on the format that I had initially developed, and then realized that most people coming on the course just weren't prepared for it. You know, they weren't prepared for a final guides exam, and that's when, the, when we brought in the assistant guide course, and uh, since the program, of course, has evolved into but I think is a pretty good system now. Are you still active today in the mountains? What what keeps you active today? Well, I, I still ski. I, you know, I actually I, I like uh, cross country and telemark ski more today than downhill ski, <laughs> and I enjoy very much uh, just the idea of you know, of traveling through the mountains. It doesn't have to be the most challenging descent or ascent, but you know, just to travel through the mountains to have a feel, see the terrain, and see the beauty around you. And the same in the summer, I, I enjoy just as much today being in the mountains as I uh, did in my Sturm und Drangzeit. <laughs> 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 but, uh,